Hi, my name is Cynthia Ricciotti from Team Dynamic Discs, and you're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast. You're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast with your hosts, Quinn Ferris and Horatio Gonzalez. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers. Welcome into the Chain Clankers Podcast. I'm your host, Q. We got a great episode for you guys today. Today, Horatio Gonzalez and I, we sat down with Cynthia Riccati of Dynamic Discs. You heard her in the intro. Honestly, this was a super fun episode. I think both casual and newer players can take something from this, as well as those who are trying to be a pro or are already a pro. I think there's a ton of good, valuable information in this episode. Horatio, what can the listeners kind of take away from today's episode? Yeah, so thanks so much for Cynthia for coming on. And like you'll hear in the episode, we heard about her. Maybe you guys have seen this video, but she is no longer a chump. You know, she is now working her way to becoming a champ. Uh, There's an old YouTube video where we first saw her, and it was the thing uh, Nate Sexton back in the day, and they'd play, you know, pros versus ams. And she pops up in this video, and she was like a really young prodigy at that, you know, and she. Yeah, just really talented young player. And we bring her on now, and she's in this stage in her life where she's ready to take on that next big step to um, in her disc golf career. She struggled. You know, she talks about how she made the decision of going, you know, full-time disc golf as opposed to going to college. And talks about that. I'm sure there's a lot of you who are maybe in that situation. And then we talk about how she's preparing for full-time uh, tour life. It's different than, you know, just doing your – regional local tournaments and she tells us a little bit about that how she's preparing to be in that competitive field of you know these amazing uh female players and ready to take on the world really exciting episode a lot of enthusiasm and i'm excited for you guys to listen to this one cynthia what is going on super excited to have you on today's show how are we doing today i'm great how are you guys we're good i was gonna say a little I guess how we heard about you or first learned about you, you know, just going through the, the disc golf rabbit hole on YouTube and going back and watching old videos, you know, and some stuff I didn't even know they used to do. I'm a new player. And one thing they used to do, Nate Sexton, I think Big German, some of them guys, <laughs> they would do the champs versus chumps. <laughs> yep. And there's one YouTube video they did. I think it was Kansas City at the Works Park, uh, Waterworks. Mm-hmm. And they were it's basically i'll let you explain a little better once we get to it but it's basically they have certain pros and they play versus a bunch of chumps just amateur locals who come out to the park play it all the time and they're playing against them and i think this one was paul Macbeth and hannah and at the time i don't think they were married yet so it was, i don't remember her last name but i think it was like whole nine or ten or somewhere through the middle this like young teenager pops up <laughs> And it's your turn to throw. And like all the comments are just like talking about Cynthia. Cynthia, like, is she like, who is this? She needs to go pro or whatever. But I'll let you tell the story. You probably tell it better than me, but tell us a little bit about <laughs> that. But that's basically how we, you know, first heard about you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it was 2017, I think, something like that. Um, it was like the day after GBO had ended. Um, and it was in Kansas City, and Kansas City is on the way back um, from Emporia, from where I live. So we're like, oh, we like this series. Why not come and try to, you know, see if I get drawn to play a hole with them? Um, so, yeah, I went to Waterworks. I was super excited, and my name got drawn on, like, hole five or something like that. And, uh, yeah. I was super nervous. If you go and watch back, I was like shaking. I'm like, I'm Cynthia I'm from Columbia, Missouri. This is, oh my God, it's Nate Sexton. So yeah, um, I don't know. The rest is kind of history. But you pure the <laughs> shot and everybody was like super impressed. And like, I'm pretty sure you got the chumps of birdie on that hole. Yeah, I, th- I think so. It was, it's been a long time. It's like almost how many years? Four years now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I joke around and my dad talks about it sometimes. I'm like, I don't remember a single thing from that oh, whole man. little moment. I was so nervous and scared. and <laughs> But yeah. 
No, that's awesome. That yeah, like I said, that's really cool. That's what a way to break out onto the disc golf scene um, with that. What was maybe the immediate reaction after that? Did you have a? I mean, you know, or maybe already participating a little bit in tournaments. Was it like, dang, this girl's really good. I I should I should go out and do a whole lot more. Or, or what did that kind of help the trajectory towards becoming a pro disc golfer at all? I mean, a little bit. I think it was like the first kind of exposure I had gotten. I had won. Uh, intermediate in GBO so I already gotten some like that regional exposure but nothing as big as Chance versus Chumps I remember I think it was Overstable had like posted a photo and they had tagged me and I was sitting at lunch with my friends and I was in like seventh grade or something like that I'm like oh my gosh I just got 200 new followers just now and it was we're all like freaking out but yeah (laughs) it's a fond memory for sure So let's rewind a little bit. Take us back, all the way back. So you've been playing for a while, it sounds like, to that point. Go all the way back to the beginning and just tell us how you got started and what that was like for you. Yeah, so I was 12 years old, so I was a sixth grader. And at my middle school, we couldn't play sports yet. Um, We had to be in seventh and eighth grade to play sports, and they started an intramural sports program. And we could choose whether or not we wanted to play kickball (laughs) or disc golf. And I'm like what the heck is disc golf? And my dad's like, oh, your uncle played it like 20 years ago. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll try that. And then three kids signed up and it got canceled. And uh, so my dad and I were like, yeah, we'll just try it. And so we go to play it against sports and buy like a Blizzard Boss and a 150 AVR. We had no idea what these things were and went out and played and we just kept playing and here I am. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome. Uh, I, I feel as though a lot of people's journeys potentially start with a played again, uh, getting some sweet discs there. Um, what, what grade? You said that was seventh grade, right? I was in sixth grade sixth when grade. I started. Okay, yeah. so there were two other people who play i mean we're going to at least sign up and play the disc golf um that sucks that that was canceled but cool nonetheless that it was even potentially offered in the first place i wish more schools would do that and hopefully you know more schools will inevitably end up doing that i think that definitely will happen here in the future um so what was it about disc golf and you know kind of getting you into it you know almost signed up for it but then it got canceled and then went and picked up a couple of discs what what kind of kept you keep playing disc golf i think it's a lot of the same reasons people uh, before me started playing. Like, it's so mesmerizing watching the flight of a disc. And personally, I like things I'm good at. And I kind of took to it pretty easily. And um, I didn't necessarily, like, fall in love with the game right away. But I saw how, like, quickly I was progressing. I mean, as much as a beginner like that could progress. But – and I'm like, I want to see how far I can take this or – how far I could get in the sport so yeah did you have friends that would go out play with you or were you just continuing to go out with your dad um it was my dad and I I mean it still pretty much is um for the first however many years I didn't really have a lot of disc golf friends per se um so it was definitely a father-daughter type deal and I played with him literally every day and it became a routine Nice. That, that's cool. I bet, I bet your dad absolutely enjoys that. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like this might be an interesting answer. Who, who wins most of the time when you guys go out? For a long time, it was him. I think there was some sort of like kind of physical advantage when it came to that because I was a very small <laughs> child. But um, nowadays, it's me. So nice. I kind of crested that hill. <laughs> that's awesome. So I guess, so you started playing sixth grade and then you're playing for fun. How long was it when you, I guess, started taking it seriously or starting to look at tournaments, starting to look at, you know, being more of a serious player? Yeah, so um, I started in September of 2014 and I played my first tournament in like January or February of 2015. So it was pretty, pretty soon early on and I played like a unsanctioned ice bowl <laughs> and uh I think I was the only one in my division, but I really loved competing and it was at like my home course. So it was super natural for me. And yeah, um, it was not very long after I started playing that I took it seriously and we started playing tournaments. That's awesome. And and I imagine this is the case, but you would end up playing the tournaments with your dad. He actually, he took a, like a, how do I put this? Like he kind of took a step back because he mm. knew that 
he saw that I had something in the sport. I was obviously progressing pretty fast for my age and how long I'd been playing. And he's like, we're just going to put everything into you. And I would like to play tournaments, but I'd rather be there for you when you played your rounds and help you. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. I mean, that's kind of ideal, I guess, having, you know, the dad to go play for fun, but then in tournaments having that support, definitely. What yeah. were what were the tournaments like for you when you started playing? Because I you said you were the only one in division, and we see that a lot. Also, um, did you ever try like getting your friends to start playing disc golf, or what was that like? Just seeing that less, I guess, um, you know, players in your divisions. Yeah. Um, at first, like, I mean, I was so young that it was really hard to be like, hey, let's go play, me and my friends or whatever, because I mean, we none of us could drive or anything like that. So. Um, yeah, I really didn't start playing with friends until I got older. And, um, uh, I remember like my first sanctioned tournament was like an all women's tournament. My dad was super excited because he's like, look, I found this, this women's tournament. It's in Kansas city. It's a great course. And, um, I got there and there was two other junior girls and I was super excited because I had never, ever seen anyone my age, let alone a girl play disc golf. So I was super excited to play in that tournament and yeah nice that's that's really good hopefully we continue to see more and more of that i know i definitely would like to see my girlfriend get out there on the course and uh slang it up in some tournaments so hopefully we can make that happen sometime um so how quickly was it going from you know playing in the junior division to kind of moving up those ranks into you know like you know obviously still being young but it's like you know i can go after higher competition than this you know how how quickly was that jump to fpo um fpo took a little bit um but moving out of juniors was pretty fast i played a total of i think three junior events outside of worlds for the next couple years um but that women's only tournament i played and i beat the second place girl by like 50 some strokes and my dad was like and my dad was like, mm, okay. And so I went on to the next one and we're like, maybe that was just a fluke. This girl seems to be better. And then I won by 30 some strokes. And then <laughs> I played my last junior tournament and I won by much more than both of those. And I'm like, okay, my dad's like, we're done. We're done. We're going to move up. And then I started playing rec and I won my rec tournament by like 20 strokes. I'm like, well, where do I go? <laughs> so I played intermediate for a while and then played advanced for a little bit and each kind of spot got smaller and smaller in the amount of time I was spending in each and um, I played my last junior worlds in 2018 and then I was like there's nothing for me in am anymore I really I didn't want to make the big drive out wet or out east to play uh, am worlds and so I went to ledgestone on a whim basically I was like a week prior I'm like I'll go play Ledgestone it's like four hours away played an FPO and ended up cashing at my first FPO pro tour event and I'm like let's just do it I don't know what else I can do at this point and I think it took about from the time I played like my first rec tournament to cashing was about three years that's awesome yeah I mean definitely you did (laughs) progress quickly like you said um, so at the stage you're at now, I guess, is, you know, you're playing a lot of, how long have you been playing FPO now? Um, this will be my, this will be my third full year competing FPO. So you're definitely getting more experience there. I guess you're starting to see more competition for sure. So now you're sitting there, you know, you're FBO, you're 18 now. And you're looking at that. I know, I remember seeing a post you made about, you know, people kept asking about whether you were going to go to college or you were going to go tour full time. I'm sure definitely that took a lot of, you know, talking with your parents, with, you know, just thinking on your own. What was that process for you and what made you make that decision? Yeah, um, I, it was such like a hard decision because I knew I loved both, but I knew that I couldn't. I couldn't do both as like well as I wanted to. Um, I mean, growing up, I'd always been a straight A student. My goal was college. My dream was college. That's all I wanted to do. Um, And that was pretty much my plan um, until COVID hit pretty much. And I saw that 
like the world as I knew it around me came crashing down and I couldn't go to school anymore. And um, my senior year was pretty much scrapped. So I was like, and the one thing I saw that was still there was disc golf and it was still there and it was still thriving. And I, I played tournaments and I did okay at them at the beginning of the season, but um, yeah. So, and I mean, that changed a little bit when I, uh, I had applied for a national scholarship program pretty much. Um, and I didn't think I was going to get it, but then I got home from, uh, USDGC and the pro tour finale and doing all that. Like the day after I got home, I got the email that I gotten it and I'm like, Whoa. And basically what that means is that all of these college partners that they have, if I got accepted into one of them, I would get a full ride. And I'm like, well, dang, this fits a whole wrench in that. Um, yeah, so I applied early action to eight schools, and I pretty much said to my dad, I'm like, this is not what I want to do. Like, I I don't like school. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do well at school. I just don't like it. And I'm like, I don't want to do something based on what, like, others want me to do or what the seven-year-old Cynthia wanted me to do. And I wanted to do something that would make me happy and what – I would wake up every day wanting to do. And uh, that was disc golf. And when I got rejected by all eight schools, I was like, let's just, <laughs> let's go for it. I mean, this is definitely not a decision that I made overnight, kind of like how I'm sounding. But um, I think a lot of factors in the last, you know, however long COVID has been a thing, almost a year have solidified me wanting to do disc golf and pursuing that as my career. Yeah. And I think that's really brave, you know, what you were saying that, you know, a, a lot of people think, you know, you have to go to college in order to make anything of yourself in life and you have to do X, Y, Z in order to quote unquote make it in life. And so I, I think that's really powerful what you just said. And I think it's something that a lot of people at home can really think about and kind of just I don't know. That's something that I know that it's going to be in my head for a little bit, just thinking about what you just said, because that that's very true. And, you know, as bad as COVID was, disc golf really grew from it. A lot more eyes got on disc golf. And so the sport is growing at a rapid rate right now. And so it's a really good time to be getting in. Obviously, you're getting in and uh, tell the t- I don't know how much this has been announced, but, you know, you are going to be going on tour full time. What like are you going to be maybe living the road life with the rv are you going to be trying to stay kind of closer to home what what are kind of your plans now that you know we've gotten to the point of all right we're going to do disc golf not school what's kind of the next steps for you yeah so definitely full tour no rv that'll be a kind of a pipe dream for the future but um my one of my best friends Haley king has kind of told me like hey if you want to do this let's do it so um I'll probably be traveling with her for most of the season. Uh, yeah. Definitely full tour. Um, I think I mapped it out. I'll be home from, like, when the tour starts to when tour ends, I'll be home a total, like, three times, which my mom doesn't like very much. But, yeah. well, that's the nature of what, you know, we all do. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's almost like if you were gone to, you know, if you had gone away to college, that's kind of – similar path you would have taken you know gone off on your own for the first time and been back home for the breaks or whatnot so it's kind of you're at that time where you're doing that same but that's awesome you say you have a you know a friend like Haley King who has been touring for a couple years now at least and who has experience and you can learn from other than her I mean you've definitely I'm sure you've talking to her but I'm sure we have other listeners who are kind of that stage where you are, where they either like to, or they want to go, you know, tour full time. So what things have you looked at? What things are you trying to learn? How are you preparing to go on tour full time? I mean, I guess there's not like one specific thing I can like say I've been doing because I was kind of like half on tour this year after the COVID restarted, played a lot of the big events. Um, I guess one thing is just like, saving money really you just want to make sure you're financially stable while you're on the road and i've been saving money so i guess as a person that may be wanting to do that in the future i think the big thing is to save money because the more money you have the less stress you're going to have when you go on the road um you don't want to have to put so much pressure on yourself to cash or 
do all these things um, right away. Uh, I mean, other than just the off season grind that we all do really as much as we can. I mean, it's been pretty cold here in Missouri, snowy. So I've been getting out as much as I can, but yeah, just trying to make sure I stay up on my skills and my uh, getting in shape and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think that's really important. It's one of those things where, at least in my opinion, you know, I've not gone on tour full time. I don't really have an intention to do so. But I feel like having the cash on hand to be able to not have to stress about the tournaments makes playing in those tournaments significantly easier and the ability to just play disc golf. And, you know, if you can play the whole tour, not cash once and still be okay, I think that's a really good spot to be in for a lot of people. That way you can just focus on your craft and focus on uh, slinging them discs. So with that said, you know, being cold in Missouri, I think this might be an interesting question. You know, what, kinds of things are you trying to work on right now what is something that you're doing that's kind of taking you to that next level because you know obviously yes going on tour tour is awesome but how do we go from going on tour to then competing at on the tour which if we look at last year a little bit i think there's some some really good signs here i mean we look at the dynamic disc open and the preserve but a top five and a top eight finish there those were looking really really good so how do we continue to make that something that we see your name on Sundays? Um, I really think it's just like continuing to grind and not getting discouraged by like uh, bad finishes or bad stretches of tournaments. Um, For me right now, uh, putting was like a big problem. So putting has been something I've really been focusing on. And since it's been so cold, my primary focus is just to not get worse, really. Um, I may not be able to get as many reps as I want to before I like, freeze out there but um just making sure i kind of keep those muscles active and keeping them warm is a big priority for me right now um yeah i feel like a lot of the times i was i had really good fairway hits and i could get it inside the circle or get it on the fairway really easily but those putts were is where i was lacking so if i can just minimize missed putts get my percentages up a little bit i feel like I'll be in the mix a lot more than I was kind of towards the end of the year. And what does your putting, I guess, routines or practice kind of look like? What are you doing there to improve? Mm -hmm. So personally, I I know a lot of people struggle with this as well. My attention span (laughs) when I practice putt is very small. Um, So either I kind of make a game out of it where I either play horse with myself or I'll just sit there and kind of focus on one spot a day and only do maybe like 15 to 30 minutes of that um, because I will kind of get sidetracked and lose focus and that that's really bad (laughs) because then you'll start like developing bad habits and stuff like that so kind of keeping my brain active as I'm putting and trying to put myself in those situations as I would be in a tournament um, yeah that's mainly what I've been focusing on. Would you say what would be better for those practicing would it be getting up a ton of shots like the the quantity of shots or really taking your time with every single putt you try to do and really focusing on that quality of putt personally it's quality i know some people depending on their kind of their stroke it might be better just to get quantity in but if you can really kind of like put yourself as if you're in a tournament um, and kind of get that quality of putt or your shot down, then it's going to not feel any different when you get to a real tournament. I, this is kind of a weird situation, but a lot of times I'll put myself at like 30 feet because that's a pretty, it's like right on the circle where you, you kind of should make it, but it's still a tester and you're not completely confident, I guess. Um, I'll kind of put myself in a situation where I'm like, okay, this putt is to win worlds or like win your first big win or something like that. Um, And that kind of puts me in that mind frame of being nervous and being uh, putting pressure on myself and kind of sets me up to uh, possibly do that in the future or, you know, put myself in a pressure, pressure situation now so that when I get to that pressure situation, whatever it may be, I'll be ready for it. So that's, that's one thing we hear from a lot of players, you know, and I know one thing, uh, for myself is when I'm still trying to improve uh, my form or other things. I'm still thinking a lot on like the mechanics of things, stuff that I'm trying to focus or tell my body to do so. You've been playing a lot longer. You've putted, 
you know, much longer than I have or a lot of people. So when you're practicing putting, uh, besides telling yourself this is like an important putt, are there things that you're focusing on or I guess at the basket or things that you tell yourself or maybe now it's muscle memory, but when you were starting out that you would try to, you know, depending on like how you kick your leg or what, what link on the change you're focusing on, just stuff like that that you would remind yourself. Do you still do that? And like, what is it? Um, yeah, I still do that. I think it depends a lot on kind of like how I'm putting at the moment. Like if I'm missing low, I'm like, okay, aim for the band. You're going to miss high. It's okay. If, like, it's not okay if I miss, but like, it's okay if you miss, if you miss high, like at least you're kind of um, correcting yourself a little bit. I know when I was first starting out, I've always kind of been a little bit of a hyzer putter. Now I'm kind of an extreme hyzer putter, much to my dismay, but um, <laughs> uh, I think focusing on how I'm like, okay, my disc is going to move right to left. So just kind of aim for that right side of the chain and you'll kind of get that hook in there that you want. Um, that was the big thing I've always kind of told myself, but yeah. Nice. What putter are you using right now? And why are you choosing that putter? Um, I, I'm using the zero medium Makana at the moment. And I say at the moment, like I've never, like, I've, like I haven't been using it for the past like five years. Um, I've actually putted with the same putter for this is going to be my sixth year putting with the same putter. So <laughs> kind of like that beat feel. <laughs> yeah. What made you go with that one specifically? A little bit of a funny story. So this is kind of a rabbit hole, but it'll, it'll come back. So um, I played the 2015 trilogy opener in Emporia, Kansas. So it was my first time ever going to Emporia, ever playing country club or any of those courses. And at the time, if you threw an all trilogy bag, then you would get like an extra bonus if you placed. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to throw an all trilogy bag. So I rounded up all the discs I had and I'm like, dang it. I have four trilogy discs <laughs> to play this tournament for so we got there and uh i didn't have a putter yet and i'm like dang it i need a trilogy putter and the trilogy challenge just that year was the makana so in my players pack i got this makana and i'm like okay this is what i'm gonna putt with and that's what i've been putting with for the past six years so it's a great feel in my hand and i like the plastic now that it's really really beaten so yeah that's nice. awesome that's pretty funny that's kind of this Similar way, I ended up with my putter. Now I put with the warden, but it was one. Uh, it was like in the players pack for a tournament we did in um, Lawrence, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of the ones they gave to us, and you got to pick from one of the three. And I picked the putter because I needed one more to practice with, and it's become my putter. So that's awesome. People should do more trilogy challenges if you can. Yes. True. Yes. True. <laughs> True. I mean, my my go to putter right now. All, side note: I am having an existential crisis with what putter to oh, use no. <laughs> because literally, I have been about the crown ever since we l did our trilogy challenge in Emporia this past year as well. I, I was putting with an AVR before that, and then I was like, "Bro, this crown is so heavy. I hate this." And then I picked <laughs> up an AVR again, and I said, "Nah." The, the crown's way better than that and so i started putting with a crown literally used it the entire season it was fine and then i was like man i really keep missing right way too dang much maybe maybe i should change it up M me being the the new being like nah it's the disc it's not me it's it's the disc and so i've literally been going through so many different putters trying to figure it out and i think i've just gotten back to the the end of the circle being like nah guy it's the crown it's always been the crown <laughs> Um, so yeah, hopefully we can get that figured out. Um, I think this has been a fantastic discussion so far. Um, are we ready potentially to get into the eighth round questions? Horatio, do you have anything else you want to get in real quick? No, I think we got a ton of good, you know, definitely good content here and I'm ready if you guys are ready. Okay, cool. Let's get into it. So these are the same five questions that we like to ask everyone who comes on the show and just kind of see how their answers differ. Uh, so for our first question, we are going to be asking what is the number one putter, number one mid range and the number one driver that you would recommend to someone who's brand new to disc golf? Hmm. Well, if brand new, uh, first one is the dynamic discs deputy. It's under, it's an understable putter. It's good for any skill level, whether you want um, a good flyer or a good putter. Um, I feel like it's great in the hand, sh fairly shallow. Um, that's good for beginners. Mid-range, um, hmm. 
I mean, I guess I'll plug it a little more than I already have. The Bounty is a great option. Um, it's a wider rim, small rim, not wider rim, like a wider diameter, small rim, um, mid-range that's good for beginners all the way up to uh, pros. But for beginners especially, it's got a very neutral flight and flies really well. And then uh, uh, very beginners, a driver. I would say the Diamond. I feel like it's uh, – really understable I know I threw it for a short period of time and it was very helpful for me and there's a quite a number of uh, women or beginners who start out with the diamond and are very successful with it so yeah nice and real quick Chris I just want to jump in another reason to do these dang trilogy challenges is because that's where the pound the bounty was first introduced yeah and that yeah. is turned out to be very very good so another plug yes. for the trilogy challenge if you haven't ever done one you have to do one this year there's so much fun oh yes all right question number two your favorite course that you have played and the number one course that you would love to play okay well i'll start with my number one course that i want to play hands down milo mciver um I'm super excited to go to Beaver State this year and play it. It's kind of always been a course I've looked at and on footage, and I'm like, I want to go there. It looks so pretty. So um, that's my course that I want to play. And for me, I really don't have favorite courses, and it's kind of weird, but I, I kind of like every course I go to for specific reasons. Um, kind of base a lot of it of on where – or like the experience I had at each course, whether or not it was like the people or how I played – um gosh this is such a hard question guys um if I had to pick just one I really like um the preserve course up in uh Minnesota we played for the preserve this year it was just a great experience and a great course to come off of from playing country club and I just I love my time there and it's a beautiful property so yeah that would be my favorite course for sure Nice. That's awesome. Those are, those are some good ones. Our third question here is what is the number one tip you would give yourself if you could go back to when you first started taking disc golf seriously, what would that number one tip be? Oh gosh. Um, don't put so much pressure on yourself. It's not the end of the world. Um, I, I, for me, I took everything super seriously, no matter if I was playing rec or now FPO, I, I'm really hard on myself. And back then I was really hard on myself. So I think just kind of reminding myself to breathe and it's not the end of the world. It's not the last tournament you're going to play. It's not the last putt you're going to miss. So it, it'll be, it'll, it's fine. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really interesting. Like my, I'll go and take out my nieces and nephews out to play sometimes. And they're kind of in that age, you know, like sixth, seventh grade. And they are brutal to themselves. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they've played like three or four times and they'll miss a putt and they're just like upset, like super upset, which is good. They have that passion right away, but I could definitely see, you know, how kids that early on would be very serious about it. So, <laughs> all right, next question, your favorite memory playing disc golf. Oh gosh. Can I say all of them? <laughs> um, I guess, I mean, it'd have to be, I mean, winning Worlds was one of the best moments of my life, and hopefully it won't be in the next 10 years and I'll win another world. But um, <laughs> I think it was just an awesome week and kind of something I'd been striving for for so long, and kind of having that finally was super relieving and having all my friends there and all the pros I looked up to watching me was kind of – it was very touching for me, and just it was awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Our our last one here we got for you today is what is the biggest mistake you see new players making? Oh gosh. Oh I think they try to they try to learn the game without learning the game per se. Like you you go play any other sport. I, I mean I was a gymnast, so I'm just gonna use gymnastics for an example. Um when you learn gymnastics, you go to a, a gym and you have coaches and you learn the proper form. And it's not, it, it's not something that you can kind of just teach yourself and be perfect at, you know. Um, and I think uh, disc golfers nowadays, they kind of 
look at pros and they're like, I'm going to do that. And then don't do that and think they're fine, you know, and um, they don't really sit down and try to learn the, the proper mechanics of throwing and they just kind of do it however they want, which is fine to a, an extent. But I think moving forward, what's going to really elevate everyone's game from the get go is learning that proper form and um, using that as building blocks to get better if they want to. That's, that's really interesting. Like, that's an awesome answer. Um, just real quick, what are some, I guess, I'm sure you looked up YouTube videos or stuff where you learn from, like, what are a couple maybe YouTube videos that helped you out that people could check out? Oh, goodness. Um, I think one that really does come to mind, and I've seen a lot of people answer this way, which is really cool, but I think Discraft did a video like way back when at Toboggan, and I think people were showing off how far they could throw and how to get 100 feet on your distance in 10 minutes or something like that. And that's one that does come to mind for me um, that I watched a lot when I was first starting. And yeah, that's the only one that really can come to mind. (laughs) Nice. Well, hey, definitely check it out. Look up on YouTube. Try to find it. If I can find it, I'll try to leave a link in the description or suggest it or put it as an end card on YouTube. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this interview. If you did, leave us a like rating. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Before we get out of here, Cynthia, do you have any sponsors you want to thank? Yes, I do. I want to thank Dynamic Discs for everything they do for me and for the disc golf community. There's big stuff in the works. Um, and Whale Sacks for everything they do for me. If you want to have dry hands when you play, get a Whale Sack. You will not regret it. Do you have a promo code potentially for, for Whale Sacks that, that the people I, could go use? I don't, but there's always some sort of sale or something nice. running. So definitely go check out Whale Sacks on their socials and at their website. So. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for taking the time uh, to come on this show with us. We wish you nothing but the best this season. Good luck. And we hope to see you, you know, on those Saturday, Sunday events, kicking butt and taking names. But yeah, thank you so much and good luck this season. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Chain Clankers podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers and hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us from so you never miss another episode.